Thank you for inviting me to this uh, mini device symposium today. I feel really privileged to be able to share with yourselves our experiences in peripheral bronchoscopy. I'm a chest physician based at North Tees Hospital. Now, for those who don't know, North Tees uh, is a um, district general hospital in the northeast of England, and we have a high incidence of uh, lung cancer in this region. We've been providing uh, convex probe e-bus service since 2008 and provide a high volume of service. Um, and in the past few years, we've uh, also been delivering the peripheral bronchoscopy service to the Northern Cancer Network. So in the next 20 minutes, I would like to give you a brief overview of uh, the components of uh, peripheral bronchoscopy that we use in our organization, support this with some of the case examples, and also talk about some of the predictors of success that we have come across in our clinical practice, and also talk about the limitations of the current technique. So what's the driver for all of this? We know that early detection of lung cancer is fundamental for increase in survival. And recently, in the past few years, we've been seeing a changing pattern in the presentation of disease with more and more peripheral um, presentation as opposed to central. And we know that we're finding increasing volumes of nodules either through um, screening or incidentally with the increasing use of imaging. And when we do find a nodule, we then faced with the, uh, um, the need to make a risk assessment and, and to make a decision as to how to proceed. And we take into consideration the pretest probability of cancer patient preferences, comorbidities, and decide on whether we need to proceed with further sampling. And in many patients, we do need some form of biopsy. So what are the options for sampling um, lung nodules? We have the CTFNA, and we know that the diagnostic yield is very, very good, over 90% as per the literature. But we know that the diagnostic yield tends to drop as the lesions um, become smaller and if uh, with the increasing distance from the pleura as well. We often have technical difficulties if the nodules are near major vessels or near the diaphragm. And of course, there is increasing risk of pneumothorax and hemorrhage, um, especially with increasing distance from the pleura. Other options would include conventional bronchoscopy with or without fluoroscopy. The outer diameter of the conventional bronchoscopes tend to be five to six millimeters. So as a result of this, they reach uh, beyond segmental bronchi tends to be rather poor and we know from studies that the sensitivity for diagnosing uh, cancer in lesions which are less than two centimeters via conventional bronchoscopes tends to be very poor. Other options include surgical biopsy but this is not always an option for our patient population. There is additional risk of um, morbidity and at the cost of potential futility and watchful waiting is not always deemed acceptable in the patient pathway. So if we were to go bronchoscopically to sample these uh, peripheral lung nodules, what are the challenges? The, we know that the bronchial tree is incredibly complex with increasing branches as we go into the periphery. And uh, even when we do know how to get there, it is actually quite physically hard to reach the periphery itself. And we also tend to rely on imaging that may be days or weeks old um, and really for various reasons the lung nodules may actually not be where we think they are when we're actually performing the procedure. And ultimately in the periphery we are very much limited to the nature of the sampling tools and they come with their own drawbacks as well. In a lot of centres these lists are done under conscious sedation, so we have patient-related factors and how well they can tolerate the, the procedure as well to be factored in. Some of these uh, techniques require a lot of training, require a lot of skills. All of that needs to be factored in when planning the service. And of course, whatever we do, we need to be mindful of ensuring that it is still financially viable and we're utilizing cost-effective approaches and really trying to um, reduce uh, or drive down the costs. So what are the principles of peripheral bronchoscopy? We usually start off with ensuring that we have an accurate localization of the uh, lesion before we start off the procedure. And there are various ways of doing that. And it usually involves navigation. So for example, we could be doing virtual bronchoscopic navigation or using electromagnetic navigation. Um, uh, which is a bit more complex and really requires a lot more training. And the, the second question is, even when we can navigate to the lesion, 
how are we going to actually reach there? And if we were using ENB, we could be using steerable catheters to, uh, to get to the lesion. Um, if not, then to consider using slimmer bronchoscopes that can actually go further down in the periphery. When we, are, when we think we are in the lesion, um, it's useful to be able to confirm that what we are about to sample is indeed the abnormal or the nodule. And this is where radial EBUS comes in handy. Um, or, uh, and in many places, we also use the fluoroscopy. Uh, the problem with the fluoroscopy is if the lesion is not visible on fluoroscopy, then it can be um, not particularly useful. Um, and this is where the augmented fluoroscopy may be useful, but then we are adding on additional costs as well to the service. There's a corn beam CT that may be helpful in this, which is not widely available. And ultimately, when we are in the lesion, we need to be carefully selecting our tools to sample the, um, the nodule. And um, this is where we may need to be a little bit creative. And depending on the, the relation of the nodule to the airway, we may need to select various different types of tools. So for example, in lesions which are adjacent to the airway, we may need to consider TBNA or even with the, um, or even consider using mini cryo probes which have uh, recently been uh, released. The key message is that usually it's a combination of the methods um, that helps us to get to the lesion. So at North Tees we um, have been using a combination of these and we use the VBN which is the virtual bronchoscopic navigation planner so that's just a laptop um, with the software in it. We utilize thin and ultra thin bronchoscopes and it's been quite useful to have the choice between the two of them. Um, and uh, we use radial EBUS with, with or without guide sheaf. We do all our procedures using 2D fluoroscopy. We've recently been getting the help from the cyto uh, technicians as well to provide rows. Most of our cases are done with conscious sedation, but on occasion we've had to enlist the help of the anesthetist, especially if, um, for example, we're thinking of doing staging all at one go. So a little bit about the VBN planning system. The one we have is called the Lung Point. It's uh, essentially just a, um, a laptop with a software. We, once we've got the CT images of the patient, we convert into a DICOM format, which we load up onto the software. And this creates a 3D virtual bronchoscopic pathway. We select the, the abnormal area to get to, or sometimes we just pinpoint the the distal end of the bronchus that we want to reach and the software then recreates the path to get us to that area. If we wanted to go a bit further we could uh, go we could get the full um, platform which uh, does synchronization and overlay of live bronchoscopic images with the virtual bronchoscopy but again there is no real-time tracking that happens during the bronchos um, during the uh, navigation and uh, with, um, with, with good reconstruction you can you can get um, images down to the um, median of sixth generation bronchi. Now there are no RCTs comparing ENB versus VBN, but a couple of maternal uh, analysis suggests that the yields are similar. We also use the thin and ultra thin bronchoscopes. Um, now compared to the conventional bronchoscopes, they're really easy to maneuver. They have extended um, range. Um, the thin bronchoscope has got an outer diameter 4.2 millimeters. So as a result of this, it can tend to get to a couple of generations further than the conventional bronchoscopes. It has got an internal diameter of 2.0 millimeters. So as a result of this, you can still use your standard forceps and your standard brushes um, if you're using it without a guide sheaf. But if you were to use a guide sheaf, then you would have to select the smaller forceps um, and brushes. We can also use the TBNA needle and you can deploy some of the mini cryoprobes through the, um, the thin bronchoscope, including with a guide sheaf as well. In comparison, the ultra thin bronchoscope that we have has got an outer diameter of three millimeters only, really, really thin, very easy to maneuver, and it's got a decent suction and reasonable views as well. It's got an internal diameter of 1.7 millimeters, which means therefore we can't put in our guide sheaf through that, but you can put your radial probe easily um, through the working channel and because of the diameter we're limited to smaller 
forceps, um, we have the 1.5 millimeter forceps, which still gives us decent uh, um, samples, but we do end up taking far more transbronchial lung biopsies um, than if we weren't using the smaller ones. So the radial probe bus, um, so essentially it's a very flexible catheter that we deploy through the working channel. At the end of the catheter, you've got a transducer. Um, so this is a 1.4 millimeter diameter mini probe that we use. Uh, we can use it without the guide sheath, as I said, through the um, ultra thin bronchoscope. And it really gives you a 360 degree um, real-time imaging perpendicular to the axis of the airway. Um, but uh, essentially when we are, when we need to sample, we normally need to remove the radial probe um, out and through the guide sheath or in, uh, even if you're not using the guide sheath, um, you would then have to deploy your forceps biopsy and your brushes to take your sample. So this is not real-time sampling. So on the left-hand side, you've got a picture um, of the ultrasound with the radial probe in the center, and you can see this, what we describe as a snowstorm appearance of normal air-filled parenchyma, whereas on the right-hand side, you can visualize a nodule um, with a hyperechogenic um, border, which represents the air tissue interface. So we're just going to proceed to a few um, patient cases just to illustrate how we use some of these tools together. So the first case we've got is a 63-year-old lady who presented with a cough. She has a background of mild COPD. She's been a long-term smoker, but otherwise very good performance status. She was found to have a, an abnormal chest X-ray, which led to a staging CT, which picked up on a solid 16 millimeter speculated lesion in the posterior segment of her upper right upper lobe. And you can see on the um, sagittal views that the, there is an area, a cystic area adjacent to it. Um, and really what we look for when we see these lesions is whether there is an airway leading into the mass. I'm not sure how it's projecting, but um, when it's magnified, you can actually see that there is a nice little airway that does lead you to the abnormality. So if it weren't for navigational bronchoscopy, we would have been thinking of subjecting the patient to CTFNA, which does come with, with its own risk. Um, so this was staged as T1B and not M0 on PET scan. So we took her CT slices and uh, loaded it into the VBN planning software. Um, and this therefore then um, loads up various views of uh, the patient's uh, scan. So you get the axial, sagittal and coronal views as well. And what we then tend to do is mark the area that we want to sample. And you can see the lesion is projected on a fluoroscopic view as well, which is quite handy to have. And really the, the, the VBN then will reconstruct the 3D path to the lesion. Hopefully the video will work. So we can see that it's asking us, which we predicted that it would go into the RB2. But really, it's quite helpful to determine that it's a couple of uh, divisions beyond RB2. And once we've seen this, we tend to have to um, memorize it. Um, it sounds a bit complex in the beginning, but with time, you do get used to it. So it's a couple of divisions beyond RB2. We, we think we know where to, how to get to it. And we in, sorry, in this case, we then um, used the thin bronchoscope uh, with a guide sheath. Um, and we deployed our radial EBUS. Now, obviously, we can see with the, uh, with, with the blood that we can see uh, through the endoscopic view, we've already taken some sample in this case, but these, it's very classic of the, the views you get because of the, um, the suction and the thin uh, um, bore. So it's quite hard to get um, the, the same views as you would with the therapeutic bronchoscope or a conventional scope. So you can see the lesion coming into view there. Um, and in this case, we then removed the radial probe and deployed our transbronchial uh, forceps and took about eight samples um, followed by brushes um, and lavage. So we tend to do a combination of mini um, of uh, biopsies with the smaller forceps and we also tend to then remove the guide sheath and um, follow where the um, where we took the samples on the fluoroscopy and go with the conventional uh, biopsy forceps as well just to get some um, bigger pieces and in this case we 
um, showed she had adenocarcinoma and she went across for surgery. The next case is a lady who has advanced COPD with an FEV1 of 34%, presented with weight loss, um, and her staging CT showed evidence of a left upper lobe lesion with uh, surrounding extensive emphysema. And you can imagine none of the radiologists really needed, wanted to, uh, to touch this patient for CTFNA. It was staged as T1B and naught as well. Um, and um, the VBN guided us to a couple of divisions beyond the LV1 plus 2, and we then went with a thin bronchoscope, and you can see on the radial probe the image that we got, and uh, we, we subsequently performed, we left the guide sheep in place and did uh, about 40 BLBs, um, followed by brushes and lavage, and this turned out to be adenocarcinoma as well, and the patient then proceeded to uh, sable. The next patient we've got is a 64-year-old male smoker who presented as an um, emergency with pancreatitis and on his uh, imaging was found to have a um, cavitating right upper lobe lesion. Um, we then did um, the navigation and the VBN guided us to uh, um, about three divisions um, beyond the RB1. And in this case, because it was the apical segment, we decided to use the ultra-thin bronchoscope um, just so that we could reach closer to the lesion. Um, so we used radiolibus, but without a guide sheath and did uh, about eight TBLBs um, and brush and lavage. And what we found was in abundant inflammatory cells. Um, so we, we essentially treated this patient with a prolonged course of antibiotics and his repeat CT at three months had shown significant improvement in the appearances, suggesting that it was a true negative test. The next patient is a 77-year-old lady with the right episode opacity on her chest X-ray and confirmed to have a, a, um, a lesion, a, a solid mass in her right upper lobe, which was just under two centimeters, and again staged as T1B and not on PET scan. And you can see there is a bronchus sign, so there's an airway leading into this. Um, which suggested that we could potentially get this through um, guided bronchoscopy. So we'll, we'll do the VBN, and in this case, it turned out to be a couple of divisions beyond RB1. And because of its location and its, it, the, the, the mass being quite distal, we decided to again use the ultra-thin bronchoscope uh, with the radial bus without a guide sheath, TBLB times 6, brush lavage, confirmed to have squamous cell, and patient proceeded to surgery. So the final case I have is of a 74-year-old patient who who is an ex-smoker and found incidentally to have a 10 times 7 millimeter endobronchial mass in the lateral segment um, of his uh, left lower lobe. And in retrospect, this lesion had been present on a CT in 2018, but it had increased in size, so increasing the probability of underlying cancer. Now, looking at the images, one could argue that we probably don't really need the navigation or radial e bus to get to this uh, lesion as long as we use a thin bronchoscope or even an ultra thin bronchoscope. But I'm hoping I can demonstrate um, how useful the VBN has been in this circumstance. So we'll just follow the path that it's reconstructing. So the VBN is now guiding us into the LB9 and it's about three divisions beyond And as a result of this, um, what it has meant is that after intubation, it's literally been less than 30 seconds to actually reach the lesion as opposed to hunting in the dark for the abnormality. So it has, um, in this scenario, reduced the procedure time, which is what you need, especially when your patient is under conscious sedation and sometimes fighting it as well. And in this case, we, you can see the endobronchial view that we got was of a necrotic mass. And because of the nature of, uh, of the lesion, we deployed the Periview Flex TBA DNA needle on two occasions, followed by slim forceps biopsies, the slim brush lavage, and this confirmed to be squamous cell carcinoma. Um, and following this, the patient underwent radiotherapy.
So there are a couple of uh, things that we look at that would are likely to increase your diagnostic yield. Uh, one of the most important factors is to see whether we've got a bronchus sign, so essentially an airway leading straight into the mass. There are various ways to classify this, but the most pragmatic one we found is the Tocoro classification. So essentially you want ideally a patient with a CT bronchus sign A where the airway leads straight into the mass, as opposed to the bronchus sign B where um, the airway is actually adjacent to the the, uh, to the mass lesion. In those cases, the diagnostic yield uh, tends to be much, much lower. Sometimes we end up using a TBNA needle, but it's not always technically possible as well. Size, so the, the, the smaller the lesion, obviously the lower the, the likely yield um, and uh, probably related to the number of airways that actually leads um, to the mass lesion as well. And, and when it's very small, it can be fluoroscopically not so visible, so it can make it quite difficult. Um, upper lobe lesions would tended to be, um, they, they uh, often be more uh, positive um, than the lower lobe lesion for, for various reasons. There's, there tends to be a lot of respiratory motion as well. Um, especially in the lower lobe lesions, and they can be um, they can be more subject to CT body divergence. And the higher the prevalence of cancer, the higher the um, diagnostic uh, yield as well. So just very quickly about the CT to body divergence. Um, this has been mostly reported with ENB, but I think it applies to any form of navigational bronchoscopy. Um, very briefly, a lot of these patients would have had a CT scan at full inspiration with their, with their arms above the head. But when you're doing the guided bronchoscopy, this, uh, the, the whole scenario is totally different. So the nodule may not actually be where we think it is. Um, and the respiratory motion can be anything more, you know, can be around... Um, 25 millimeters and it can often be more than the actual size of the nodule and that can contribute to a false negative test as well. Other practical challenges that we've come across so uh, sometimes we've been able to localize the lesion on the radial probe bus and yet frustratingly the the test turns out to be pathologically a false negative test and there can be many reasons for that. First of all, when we're sampling, this is not real-time sampling, again, you've got to remove your mini probe and in that process, uh, the forceps biopsies can sometimes just get lodged into a different subsegment. Um, and one of the other factors could be that the lesion is actually eccentric, so not really uh, fully peribronchial, um, but just adjacent to the airway contributing to the false negative test. And sometimes on a radial probe bus, you can get false positive changes. We've seen a couple of occasions when we've used uh, excess amount of saline just in an attempt to open up the airway so we can advance the uh, slim or ultra slim bronchoscope further and that can cause a bit of false positive changes on the ultrasound images as well. You can get similar appearances with hemorrhage or a bit of atelectasis all contributing to false negative tests and of course you can have you can get some degree of tumor heterogeneity as well with necrosis and fibrosis contributing to all of that. And ultimately we are limited with the size of the samples that we get as well especially Especially with the, um, the really small forceps that we have to deploy with the ultra thin um, bronchoscopes, you do get very, very small samples. And as a result of this, you do need to um, often um, take a lot more biopsies to get decent samples. So really, I'm hoping that with all these cases, we've been able to get a feel for how they, they, they can get, to, you know, get together to really be able to get to the lesion better to improve our diagnostic yield. But it's fair to say that the landscape for um, peripheral bronchoscopy is really evolving. It's a very exciting era, um, but not one single tool fits all. We really need a complement of um, tools to be able to get us that uh, diagnosis. Um, and whatever we do, it's essential that we um, ensure that it is cost effective so that we can apply this um, to um, um, many more centres for widespread adoption as well. Thank you.